Would you stand with me? Let's read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. And it says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of, his, of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Lord, this morning as we spend some time with you in your word, we pray that the written word would lead us to Jesus Christ, the living word. And we pray that Christ would be magnified. We pray, Jesus, like John the Baptist said, that we would become less and you'd become more. That your word would do that work in our hearts. And so, Lord, we're looking unto you this morning. And we pray that you'd speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I've been thinking on this, that verse uh, 6 says this, for, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. To us a son is is given, or you know, the King James says, Unto us a son is given. And these are the words of Isaiah. He wrote them uh, 700 years before the birth of Christ. And if you've spent, as you know, if you've spent much time in your life around church during the Christmas season or grown up in church, these are words that you're probably very familiar with. Probably familiar with to the point that. You read it and there's not much amazement in your heart. Or maybe not much consternation in your heart. But this is actually a very amazing prophecy. To say unto us a son is given. Unto us. That's first person plural pronoun that the prophet uses to refer to himself and to other people. A son is going to be given to us, we will be the object recipients of a child, which is kind of strange when you think about it in this kind of collective sense. When a son is born, that is not how you speak of a child's birth. That's not how you speak about a son's uh, birth. We say, oh, so-and-so, you know, I was trying to think of the latest family to have a, a boy in this church. I guess it's Mike and Sarah, you know, and a son was born to them. We say so-and-so gave birth to a son and we recognize the biological mother and father and we don't speak of a son's birth as belonging to a collective whole. To us, a child is born. But that's what Isaiah prophesied. A son, he says, given to us. Unto us, a son is given. And it makes me wonder what kind of son this would be that he would be given for all, the Hebrew word given is the, is the, it's the name. We use it as a name, Nathan. It means given, provided, granted unto you. A son is provided for you. And so it makes me ask this question, what was given to us a, a son? And the most logical question that you would ask if someone is giving you a son is to say, whose son is it? Well, whose son is it? I mean, if this son is being given to me, whose son is it? You know, determining the identity of a father, a birth father, the, the progenitor, is very important to the identity of a child, isn't it? Like if we went around the room and we took the time this morning and I said, who is your father? Every one of you could answer in fact, culturally, we have words that we use for illegitimate children. Derogatory, unpleasant words that identify the progenitor is not known or is in question. The identity of the biological father is unknown. You know what I'm talking about. It rhymes with dastard, okay? <laughs> not going to say it. Legitimacy is attached to the identity of the father. It's why every character in the Old Testament, their name is attached to their fathers. David, son of Jesse. 
Joshua, the son of Nun, Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah. And so it's natural that if the word of God tells us, unto us a son is given, we would say, whose son is he? Whose son is he? Whose son is he that he would be given for us? You know, the Bible tells a story in the book of Kings illustrating the wisdom of Solomon. That's a great story. I love it. And you probably know it. Two women were brought to him. And they were in a conflict and no one had been able to help them navigate this conflict. In fact, these two women were prostitutes, the scripture tells us. And they were arguing about a son. They were arguing about the identity of a son and both claimed that the child was theirs. And as Solomon investigated, he came to understand that both of these women had given birth to sons. But in the night, one of them had rolled over on her new baby and he had died. So she took the dead child and she laid it beside the woman who had a living child. And she took the living child and laid it beside herself, swapping the one child with another while this mother slept. And now she had a living son and the other woman had a dead son. A dead child laying beside her. And so when the woman awoke and there was a dead baby beside her, upon closer inspection, the word of God tells us that she realized, this isn't my child. This is the child that belongs to the other woman. And she's taken my child, but there were no witnesses. It was one woman's word against another. So Solomon said this famously, bring me a sword. I'll cut the child in two. And the woman who was not the mother said, great idea. I won't have a child and you won't have a child. Everything will be even. But the biological mother said, no, don't cut the child in half. Give the child to her and let the boy live. And Solomon wisely discerned, determined that the woman who wanted the boy to live was the mother's child. Was the mother of the child. See, knowing the identity, the biological identity of parents matters. You know, sometimes we question it in our culture. I think about old Prince Harry there. All the rumors around Prince Harry because he seems to look awfully a lot alike that British captain that his mother was hanging out with for a little while. Or how about our very dear own prime minister? Because put his profile picture beside, uh, you know, a Cuban dictator named Fidel. And it's just kind of natural to ask, who is his father? Isaiah said this, unto us a son is given, but whose son is he? That's the question. Jesus asked the Pharisees about this. He said, let me ask you a question. Whose son is the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said this, they said he's the son of David. And Jesus said to them, David called him Lord. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And they were silenced. In fact, Matthew chapter 22 tells us that no one was able to answer Jesus. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him a question again. It's amazing. He silenced the religious leaders. No more questions. And so the identity of this son whom Isaiah prophesied would be given is very important. So the question is this, whose son is he? Well, firstly, the word of God tells us he is the son of God. The son of God. Jesus is the son of God. By the way, the scripture says that you and I are called sons of God. Ladies too. Sons of God. But this designation given to Jesus is different. It's a uniquely divine title given to him that expresses his deity. There is a distinction between him as the son of God and you and I as sons of God. The son of God is a title that meant God was his father in the sense in, in which no one else has. He and the father have a relationship that no other has. And Jesus is called the only begotten son. You know, Islam teaches that God has no begotten. Did you know that? I should have put a picture of this up, but the shrine called the Dome of the Rock that sits on the Temple Mount, you know that golden dome that sits up there on the Temple Mount? 
all around it in the whatever Arabic script it is that goes around the outside of that building, it just repeats and it says, God has no begotten. God has no begotten. God has no begotten. It's a blasphemous edifice on the temple mount to the Lord. And the hang up around the word begotten has to do with progeny. The Muslim would ask this, how can God have a son? Saying God has a son implies that God participated in some sort of procreative act to bring about the birth of a son. But that's not what the word of God is teaching. When Jesus is called the only begotten, it does not reference human generation of Christ or some procreative act of God. Rather, it speaks of his unique relationship as the son. He has a distinct personality in comparison to his father. He is co-eternal with his father, co-equal with his father. The father speaks about this in the book of Hebrews in chapter 1. The father tells us of his son. It'll be on the screen. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God... Your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Jesus did not become the son of God. He was not procreated and created to be the son of God. He became, uh, he was the son of God inherently in eternity past. And Jesus taught the uniqueness of sonship when he called God his father As you know, in the gospel accounts, it blew the minds of the religious leaders. For them, it was blasphemous. And you know, Jesus never actually said, Our Father, except in one circumstance when he was teaching his disciples to pray. That's the only time he ever said, Our Father. Rather, what we see in Scripture is he referred to God as my Father. Like in the telling of the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus warned. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Encouraging people to pray in Matthew 18, he said this. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask... It will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Instructing those who listen to him to be uh, practicing forgiveness with one another in the midst of conflict. Jesus said this in Matthew 18, 35. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. All of these discussions that Jesus had were between himself and his disciples, not the crowds. I mean, this is the inner crew that was hanging with Jesus. And he didn't say our father. He said my father in heaven. He did not include them in his unique relationship with the father as the son of God. When others came to the place where they would acknowledge his identity, acknowledge his deity, They applied the Son of God to him. Even the devil did this. When Jesus was being tempted in Matthew 4, he said, If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. The demons in Matthew 8, before Jesus gave them permission to enter the swine, they said this, What do you have to do with us, O Son of God? When Nathanael was told by Jesus that Jesus had seen him, Uh, Before they met, sitting under the tree, Nathanael confessed and he said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. So every claim to be the Son of God, every confession that Jesus was the Son of God, shows the eternal relationship that he had with his Father, between Father and Son. So whose Son is he? Well, firstly, he's the Son of God. Uniquely the Son of God. There was never a time in his relationship with the Father that there was a beginning. He was the eternal Son of God. 
Secondly, he was the son of Mary, the scripture tells us. The son of Mary. When Jesus came to Nazareth, and he taught there in the synagogue when his ministry had begun, many of those who heard him and had watched him grow up and known him since he was a little boy were astonished. They said, where did this man get these things? How was this wisdom given to him? How are his hands doing such mighty works? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, they said? That's an entirely justifiable question when they heard him teach and saw what he did. They'd watched Jesus mature from childhood to manhood. Nazareth was a small, small village. Probably many of them had items in their house that he had built. The son of Mary. In his humanity, he was as much a son of Mary as he was in his deity, the son of God. Son of God, of course, expresses his deity. Son of Mary expresses his humanity. Very God of very God and very man of very man. A combination of divine and the human that's mysterious but necessary so that he could redeem us from sin's power and consequence. Jesus needed to be God so that he would have the power and effectiveness in his death to defeat sin. And Jesus needed to be man. He needed to be flesh and blood to share in our humanity in order to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And so that title, Son of Mary, is very important to his humanity. Remember the, the story from Luke chapter 1 that the angel appeared to Mary and said, You will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. And she said, how can this be? <laughs> I'm a virgin. I know where babies come from. And the angel answered her amazingly and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore, the child born to you will be called the Son of God. And Mary conceived when she had no husband. And she conceived while she was yet a virgin. And we know, as I said, that's not where babies come from. But the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. The word overshadow you means this. It means he will encapsulate you. He will encase you. He will envelop you. You'll be imprisoned by the Holy Spirit. Mary was enveloped by a shadow is what the scripture is telling us. And the purpose was not simply so that she would conceive. This is very important, church. The purpose was not simply so that she could see, could, would conceive. The power of the Holy Spirit overshadowed her womb also so that the child would receive Mary's humanity but not her sinful nature. Mary was enveloped by the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Spirit, so that the child was not influenced by her sinful nature. And the angel said this. He will be called the son of God. So whose son is he? Unto us a son is given. He's son of God. Son of Mary. And in the word of God he's also called the son of David. Son of David. The genealogy in Matthew begins by identifying Jesus as the son of David. This means that, that he had a connection with the royal line of the Hebrew people. He is the true heir to the throne of David. When David was king over Israel, the Lord sent the prophet Nathan to communicate to him the divine covenant. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, the covenant stated this, that one of David's descendants would sit on the throne of David Forever and ever, and he would rule an everlasting kingdom over the house of Israel. And when you read the scripture, you know, you start into the story of Solomon, David's son, the heir to the throne. And you begin with Solomon, and it's like he's this amazing character as his story starts out. And he leads the nation in this time of unprecedented peace and prosperity. But as time goes on... Solomon turns into a disaster. Under his leadership, the nation turns to the worship of the gods of the nations around Israel. 
And then after Solomon, more than a hundred years after his death, God raised up the prophet Isaiah and Isaiah prophesied an everlasting kingdom. The same kingdom that the Lord had promised David. Let me read to you our text again. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. It says this. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. On the day of Christ's triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey and the crowds laid their cloaks on the road before him and they waved their palm branches and they sang, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. To the son of David. And as we know, it was just days later that they sang him another song. Crucify him. Crucify him. His blood be on us and our children. Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. He was rejected. Though he was the son of David, he was rejected by men. He is the son of David. And the genealogies of Matthew and Luke demonstrate that the royal line not only came to him through his mother Mary, but through his stepfather Joseph. His mother biologically and his father legally. The birth records held in the temple at the time of his life showed a double claim to the throne of David. But he was rejected by his own. But one day, church, the son of David is coming again. So whose son is he? He's son of God, son of Mary, son of David. And the scripture tells us he's also the son of Abraham. The son of Abraham the son of David is a title that's about his royalty, about his uh, access and right to the royal line of the house of Israel. Well, the son of Abraham is a title that extends over all the nations of the earth, all nations. When God made his covenant with Abraham, he promised all the families of the earth, Jew and Gentile, all families of the earth will be blessed by your seed. And the covenant that God made with Abraham was an everlasting covenant. Jesus is the son of Abraham. Matthew calls him so again in the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. And through his death and resurrection, the offer of forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life is offered to all people everywhere, all nations, Jew and Gentile. Jesus is Reaching out in his grace to the families of the earth. Amen. When he comes again as the son of David. He'll deal with his enemies. And when they've been dealt with as the son of Abraham. He will bless all nations. They'll be blessed by Abraham's seed. So whose son is he? He's son of God. Son of Mary. Son of David. Son of Abraham. And the word of God tells us he's the son of man. Very important title. Very important title. The son of man is the title that Jesus most often used in reference to himself. When you read, to the, read the gospels, he referred to himself as the son of man often. Now, for sure, that title, son of man, it refers to his humanity. But it is a title that is not constrained to just simply his humanity. It's not restrained by his humanity. There's something more to this title than just a reference to his humanity as the son of man. When Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus in John 3, he said this. John 3, 12. I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And Moses 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Later he said to Nicodemus, or when, or sorry, when he was speaking to his disciples, he spoke about uh, having the words of eternal life. And he said to them, my flesh is true food. And the disciples were struggling with the concept. They said, this is a hard teaching. And Jesus said to them, does this bother you that I would say this? He said, what if you were to see the son of man ascending to where he was before? When Stephen from the book of Acts was laying, dying, as he was being stoned to death, martyred for the testimony of Jesus, he lifted his eyes and the word of God tells us he looked toward heaven and he said this, I see the son of man standing at the right hand of God. Jesus is the son of man. Who is the son of man? Well, it's a very specific title that refers back to an important Old Testament text from the book of Daniel. Daniel is one of the greatest prophets in the word of God, one of the greatest Hebrew prophets. And in Daniel 7, Daniel records a vision of a man from heaven. This man who came to him from heaven. And it says this in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. I saw in the, vis in the night visions and behold the clouds of heaven. And there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. To the son of man that Daniel saw given to him was all dominion. All glory and a kingdom that all peoples everywhere should serve him. An everlasting kingdom and an everlasting dominion given to him by the ancient of days. This is amazing because Daniel saw the son of man was in heaven before his human birth. For it was he who descended out of heaven and ascended to heaven after his resurrection. Sir Robert Anderson said this, be on the screen. It was not his human birth that constituted him the son of man. That birth indeed was the fulfillment of the promise which the name implied. But the son of man, he declared explicitly, descended out of heaven. Jesus was the son of man before his incarnation. That's what the word of God is telling us. Jesus was the son of man before the virgin birth. And the virgin birth and his incarnation was merely part of the program. It was a stage in God's salvation story. God's salvation history and fulfillment to Christ's mission as the son of man. Jesus said this in Luke 17. The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. And so the name son of man has its origin in eternity, church, a title that comes from the heavenlies. This is a name that proves God planned his act to redeem us through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection before the foundation of the earth was laid. Lyman Strauss said this. The program of salvation for mortal men required the incarnation of deity. It had to be determined upon which of the three persons this task, task logically devolved. And for two, the son was indicated. Not the father, not the spirit, but the son was to be made after the fashion of men. This is why we say this. That Christ added humanity to his deity. This is proper biblical theology. He added humanity to his deity. He was not a man who achieved deity. He added humanity to his deity. Jesus was made in the likeness of men that he might redeem those made in his image. Jesus is the son of man. 
So unto us a son is given. Whose son is he? Jesus is the son of God. He is the son of Mary. The son of David. The son of Abraham. The son of man who is at the father's right hand. And he. He. This son, Isaiah says. Was given for you. This son was given for you. Not only did Isaiah prophesy that this son was to be given for you, but Jesus Christ himself declared this. Jesus declared that the father gave him as a gift so that those who would receive this son might have eternal life. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus declared his intent purpose from the father in Luke 17, 10. The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. And Jesus declared in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27 to 28. For the son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here that will not taste death until the son of man. They see the son of man coming in his kingdom. He said this. The Son of Man has promised that He is coming again. He promised that. And when He comes, He says this, I will repay each man according to what He has done. But He also said this, I'm the door. And if anyone enters by Me, He will be saved and He will go in and out and He will find His pasture. Church, Son of God, Son of Mary, Son of David, Son of Abraham, Son of Man, was given for you. God's gift to you. So that you would not perish in your sin, but that in Him you would find life and life eternal. And Jesus said this, I'm the door. By me you enter. By me you come in and out and find pasture. And through me, you will be saved. This is what Christmas is about. You know, when we talk about all the gifts, we need to be reminded the greatest gift ever, always, in all of eternity. The Son of God, the Son of Mary, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham, the Son of Man given for you. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to invite the worship team to come and let's pray. Lord Jesus, this morning as we consider your word, we just want to thank you. We want to thank our Father in heaven. Thank you, Jesus, that you're God's gift, God's son given for us. Unto us a son is given. And Jesus, this morning, as your word instructs us to do, we, we open our hearts to receive you. And your word says that we do that by believing in your death and resurrection and confessing with our mouths that you are Lord. And so, Lord, as we search our own hearts right now, I pray, God, that you and your grace and by your spirit would just bring faith. Faith. With regards to the death and resurrection of Jesus, crucified for our sins to be forgiven and raised from the dead so that we might have life. Lord, this morning before you in our hearts, we believe in your death and resurrection. And with our mouths this morning, we confess Jesus Christ, your Lord, your Lord. And we invite you to come and rule over our hearts and rule over our lives. We know that you, the son of man, have been given all dominion and authority and all kingdoms and all peoples. And Jesus, this morning, 
Just in a posture of humility before you, we bow the knee of our hearts and we confess that you're Lord. And we invite you to rule over us, rule over our lives, over our families, over our church, over our community, and over our nation. You're King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Father, we thank you this morning for your grace and your goodness. That in all of eternity, you planned that you'd give your son for us. And as we ask, whose son is he? This morning, we acknowledge son of God, son of man. Son of Mary, son of David, son of Abraham, the promised coming one. And so Jesus, we enter in by you the door to find rest for our souls. Harbor from the storm and green pastures where you lead us beside still waters. We rest in you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to strive for salvation. But we enter in by faith. And we thank you for your grace to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.